Thanks for coming out of your uh, lunch break today. I appreciate everyone being here. Um, today I want to talk about, I want to give you a brief introduction to some things, some initiatives we're doing at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, kind of our approach to problem solving and, um, and how we're trying to inspire conservation of the ocean. Um, as, thanks for that introduction, Kyle. Uh, as Kyle mentioned, I oversee our research and science groups. And so I'm going to talk about some of the things that we've been doing for the past few years. Um, one of the really important things to know about the aquarium is, and even I was surprised about this, is we haven't been around that long. We haven't even been around um, 40 years that. But our roots go actually back pretty deep. And our roots are kind of based in two institutions. And one of them is uh, Stanford University. This is the Hopkins Marine Station that started in 1892, 125 years ago, in Pacific Grove, California. Uh, they moved their initial lab, which is what you see right here. But what I love about this photo is that this is what a marine biologist looks like in 1892. It looks rather Victorian, but you still see the kind of the shenanigans of the people hanging out on the roofs. Everyone wants to be a marine biologist, um, but not everyone knows what a marine biologist looks like. This is what a marine biologist looks like. Um, we're also, uh, so that spirit of, of uh, investigation and research is very alive in what we do. The other institution is one much closer to where we are right now, and that's Hewlett Packard. Um, uh, HP founded in a garage in Palo Alto, arguably uh, one of the, uh, by David Packard and Bill Hewlett. David Packard's daughters uh, were the ones that founded the aquarium. And so the spirit of innovation from Silicon Valley and the investigation from Stanford is really where our roots are as an institution. We've been science-based from day one, and, uh, and we owe a lot to these two institutions. David Packard is sometimes, uh, you know, he's widely viewed as a, as a titan of Silicon Valley. His supervisor at Stanford, uh, Terman, is, is widely referred to as the father of Silicon Valley. And Terman got his PhD at MIT with Vannevar Bush, if, you, if that name sounds familiar. He wrote Science, the Endless Frontier. He was the first science advisor to a U.S. president, to FDR. And so our roots, if you, academics love to trace their roots back to where it started. And Vannevar Bush at MIT is, you could argue, is that's maybe where the aquarium started. So this is the aquarium. This is a view off our back deck. I would say that our secret sauce is that we're about place. We're about the Monterey Bay. Um, and as you can see, maybe this wasn't taken today um, because it's raining, um, but it's a glorious place. There's a lot of amazing creatures and ecosystems just in the Monterey Bay. Um, and it's an interesting story about the history of conservation in Monterey. It wasn't always the way it is today. Um, it's a story of fisheries collapse, of immigrants coming in and bringing new technologies, of the sociology of that always not being perfect, but working things out, it's a story of marine protected areas and the ecosystems actually returning and the fisheries coming back. And so it's not always been uh, an easy story, but the story of this place I think is very important uh, for marine conservation and the story of the ocean. So um, that's where we are. Um, one of the things that we're working on in the science team is to solve problems. And even though we have roots in academia and in Silicon Valley, um, we are, you know, we have, we're a modest operation. We, there's only so much that we can do. And so when we want to solve a problem, of course we're going to bring science to bear on that problem. That's what our research group helps support. But we also bring policy, and we also do quite a bit of communication. And so our theory of change is not necessarily um, focusing on one of those, but doing all of those and trying to do all of them really well. We have around 2 million people that come into our physical building every year, and we have you know, um, um, too many people, and we probably have about 50 times those engagements online. So we have an incredible ability to reach people and educate them about the ocean. A great example of this combination of science and policy and communication is the Seafood Watch. Um, it's an app. It started as a paper card that a consumer could use to make the best choices about sustainable shellfish, um, aquaculture fish, or wild-caught fish. And it kind of works, you, you can, um, if you're interested in mahi-mahi, you can look at the variety of places that they come from, the variety of ways they're caught, and choose the best, most sustainable solution. And so this is a great example. We may not be able to reach the scale of research that, that a university could do. We may not be able to do the scale of policy that a federal agency could do. And we may not have the communication reach of an organization like Google, but we try to do all of those at the same time to solve problems. 
So one brief example of that, um, Kyle mentioned bluefin tuna. We've been working on bluefin tuna in the Pacific uh, for 20 years. And it's an amazing creature that, um, we don't, that we didn't know a lot about at that time. And we learned about uh, bluefin tuna through tagging them. And through tagging them by putting uh, living tags on them, uh, satellite tags that pop off and then report a lot of data to us, uh, how deep the fish went, uh, its migratory path, its body temperature, um, it's accelerometry devices on there. Um, and we tagged them in the East Pacific here and we developed these practices. We innovated these techniques, these surgeries to do these tags. Um, these fish are about 18 months to five years of age. We tagged them in the West Pacific in Japan when they're of breeding age, so much larger fish, much more difficult to work with. And we actually tagged the babies at the various stages. And so the getting access to those places really helps us understand where they're going, how long they're there, and their complete life cycle. And I mentioned that we do more than research. Our goal, of course, is to recover the population. It's over 97% depleted from its historical numbers. And this past year, we had a major victory in getting all the tuna fishing nations in the Pacific Ocean to agree to recover the population. And so while science and communication and working through Seafood Watch and celebrity chefs, um, this is our goal. Now that we have a political agreement, we really have to focus on how we're going to rebuild it. Everyone says, yes, we want to rebuild the population. Now how do we do it? Now science and research is going to come back to the forefront. So this is something that I really use to guide our team. It's a quote from Ed Catmull, who uh, runs Pixar, wrote a book called Creativity, Inc. I really love this because when we bring scientists in, we expect them to know science. Yes, we may bring them in, we may train them and do some things, but we're really going for art. And what I mean by that is, uh, I'll give you an example from Hawaii. I lived in Hawaii for seven years. I worked in a variety of different capacities there. But we had a problem of only having a limited data set of fish populations and exploitation. It only went back to about 1950 after World War II. Hawaii wasn't even a state yet. And we needed a longer term uh, data set in which to make decisions to know about the status of different fish populations. And we had this gap. You can see there's a gap on the x-axis between um, we have two points in 1900 and 1902 when an economist came out and surveyed the fish markets in Hawaii, and then we didn't have any other data until 1950, 1952, something like that. So what I did is I went back and I found data um, in restaurant menus, in Waikiki restaurants, and we got about 500 different restaurant menus, and on these menus were just a teeming with marine life. But what was fascinating is about, it wasn't always the same throughout time. The early menus had all these fish on there that were high value fish still today, but just were not being served in the restaurants and the catch had gone down. So we took a bunch of data off them and were actually able to fill in some of the blanks over time because the menus went back before the official catch records did. So that was really cool and I have to tell you, uh, finding these menus, it's not like there's a Dewey Decimal number for restaurant menus. So it's not like you just go to your public library I, I met some people in, you know, in their garages, their, their tutu, their grandma in Hawaiian, um, gave, would give them a box of something and then they had it in the attic or something like that. We ended up getting 500 menus probably from uh, hundreds of different sources. Um, some people collected them as curios, as souvenirs of their trip to Hawaii, a cruise from San Diego in the 1930s or something like that. I got them off eBay, I got them off Craigslist. Uh, all sorts of places. I met a lot of great people and heard a lot of great stories. But the reason I'm showing you this because of, is because of this plot in the lower right, the green plot. Those are the data, but this is my inspiration for them. I'm, I'm sort of quoting the Nepali coast, if that makes sense. If anyone's been to the island of Kauai, it has an astounding coastline that, is, that was, I guess you could say, it was sort of made famous in the movie Jurassic Park when the helicopter comes in. Um, but this, these are the data here, but we're trying to be artful about it. And we're quoting, we're saying, this is a paper about Hawaii. Let's show Hawaii somehow. So the Nepali coast is kind of embedded in this. Another um, thing um, that we've been looking at is modeling the risk to coral reefs and the fisheries in, the, in those reefs, sort of like the fisheries fall out from the collapse of reefs, if you want to think about it like that. And we're trying to think about all sorts of ways to visualize the data. And there is a map, and here's the sort of major ecosystems, the top 29 ecosystems where reefs are. And we're ranking them and trying to prioritize where risk lies the most. Um, but if you perhaps are familiar with this band from the early 80s, we're quoting this album cover, uh, Joy Division. 
Um, and uh, there's actually a package within the, the software application R that you can use. It's called Joyplot. And we're just quoting this Joy Division because they're kind of a cool band. And it's actually a good way to visualize the data. But there's all sorts of ways to be artful about how you discuss the story of the data and how you visualize it. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do. A big thing for us is how do we observe and analyze data autonomously? Um, you guys are probably in a, in a similar business, I would imagine. Um, this sort of story begins with Rachel Carson's book in the 1960s, Silent Spring. And I think one of the things we really learn from that is that there's no such thing as a way. That's what we say, there's no such thing as a way. Um, and if you're thinking about sustainability, you're thinking about um, closing the, the loop, having a circular economy, um, waste equals food, you've probably heard of before, one of my professors used to say. And uh, this consciousness really came because of Rachel Spring. If you throw something in a river, it doesn't go away. The river takes it to some other place, right? And so we're thinking about this in the North Pacific in terms of microplastic pollution. It's become, you've probably heard about plastic in the ocean. It breaks down into very small bits, smaller than a millimeter, then it's microplastic. And then it gets into the food web and it has toxins in the material of the plastic. It absorbs toxins from the water column, so on the surface, and then it gets into the food web. You've probably heard about these uh, great Pacific garbage patches, these gyres which sort of physically concentrate the plastic. And one of the things that, that we're really fascinated by is those are not areas of high biological importance. We sometimes refer to them as biological deserts, actually. There's an area immediately to the south of this gyre on the right and between California and Hawaii, where we've seen a lot of great white sharks congregate. It's called the White Shark Cafe. Mm -hmm. And we sort of refer to that as like the burning man for white sharks, mm -hmm. because they're going out to, a lot of the males are going out to the desert. We don't know if it's for, to meet someone special, or if it's to get a bite to eat, or to have a, a, an, an experience. Um, but um, this garbage patch, um, I, I've, I have not been to the garbage patch, but on the very periphery of it is the big island of Hawaii. And one of the beaches there called Camilo Beach is very famous for its sand essentially being plastic because it's buffering right on the edge of that gyre and it just sort of scrubs like friction, the plastic out of the water as it hits the edge of that beach. And I worked on sea turtles a lot in Hawaii. This little hawksbill turtle is probably four months old. It would fit in the palm of your hand, about nine centimeters long was its shell and it had 41 pieces of plastic in its gastrointestinal tract. It didn't make it. And so this, this is a problem with animals ingesting it. It's an acute challenge. But there's also this longer term challenge, and we don't know the implications. Like I said, there's a lot of plastic in those gyres, but the area up top where it goes from cool green to sort of warmer yellow and red is this thermocline that we know is a biodiversity hotspot. It's a path along which whales and turtles and large fish like bluefin tuna and swordfish travel, and it's where a lot of fisheries congregate. Now, how do we get out there and measure plastic at the scale of thousands of kilometers? If we're gonna do that, it's gonna be a drone. We can't afford to send big, hundreds of long foot ships out there that cost tens of thousands of dollars a day. It's much more feasible to send a drone. So we're gonna work with Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, it's kind, of like, it's kind of like your younger sibling that gets all the cool toys. That's kind of how Ambari is for us. And they have an exceptional talent of creating sensors and putting them on vehicles to go observe the places in the ocean at scale and inaccessible places like the deep, which is one of the things they focused on. And so we're developing technology to monitor that transition zone, that area of biological importance in the North Pacific to really survey it for plastics. We think that what's going on with plastic in that place is a lot more important than what's going on in the desert by comparison, because that's an ecosystem biodiversity hotspot. So not only observing the data, but interpreting and analyzing the data needs to be autonomous. We're using, this is, you're not meant, you're not supposed to see all these individual plots. There's 268. Uh, spectra from microplastic. Every little piece of plastic that we have pulled out of the ocean, we have to read with a, um, to read their spectra to determine what it is, and we cannot do that manually. So we're using machine learning algorithms, neural networks, 
um, to process these and identify them at scale. If we were to do this in the ocean at the scale of the problem, we need to have we need to match the scale of observation and the scale of analysis to the scale of the problem. And that's an ocean. So we're using autonomous observation, drones, and we're using autonomous analysis and machine learning. But what I really want to talk about is this. Um, you all are familiar with search. Search is everything. But you can't do search if you don't have memory. And so if you don't have memory, you have nothing. What we're trying to do, uh, we just opened a new lab in our conservation uh, research group, and it's called the Ocean Memory Lab. And the idea behind this lab is that we're trying to build long-term records, uh, ecological records of the ocean, so we can have proper baselines for ecosystem health. If we don't have that memory of what a healthy ocean is, not just the last 10 years, not the last 40 years, way beyond my lifetime, hundreds of years, how do we build that record? because that record is absolutely integral for understanding where we are, where we need to get back to, and then perhaps some paths on how to get there. So this is a important, an incredibly important plot. It's the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere as measured from the Mauna Loa Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii. And so this is just, what I want to show you is this magic red line. Let's think of that as a baseline. 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a line that we had kind of set several years ago as something we never wanted to cross. Well, we've crossed it. We crossed it in uh, 2015, I think, for the first time. And you can see there's a seasonal cycle, sort of the air, the planet breathing, rather. And um, it goes up and down with the northern hemisphere forest in the winter being deciduous and losing their leaves, and the ocean cycle. Now, as I go back and as I add more data to that, you can see how far apart the historical observation is from that red line that we didn't want to cross in 400. We go back to 1950, we go back to 1900, we go back to 1800, and we can even go back further. Now, how do you think that this graph was built? You can see there's sort of three different sections of the graph. Well, the first part, oh, you can go back even further. Um, the first part is done with an instrument measuring it beginning in 1958. You know when you've made a good scientific figure when they embronze it and put it on the side of a building, right? It should be like every scientist's goal that they'll embronze a figure that I've made. And maybe my restaurant menu is one we'll get there someday, but, but, um, but, but not today. So um, Keeling from Scripps Institute of Oceanography started these measurements in 1958. And then when they said, you know, you're onto something here, um, but we need more data. We wish you had done that in 1758. But of course, we didn't have sensors. So how do you think they went back and built it? They went through glacial ice cores. They went to Antarctica. And dozens of teams from all over the world of international collaborators have worked to build this together. But this plot is called the Keeling Curve, right? And this is the absolute important baseline for us to measure climate change and where we are today. This is what began it all, really. And we don't have one of these for plastic. We don't have one of these for a lot of problems. So how do we build this memory? Well, let's go back to this idea of drones. There is a drone inside. There's a payload with uh, data, an observation scheme of some sort, sensors, uh, some sort of propulsion. There is energy. There's battery of some sort. And then probably some sort of way to transmit the data back to Moss Landing uh, to Ambari. Well, when I go out to Ambari, I say, I've been working with drones my entire professional life. But I've never touched one of those things. I have touched one of these things. This is a sea turtle shell. And what my, uh, my idea is that actually animals are drones. They, are, they, have long, they have tissues that they take data on their ecosystem experience and are recording it and are learning all sorts of stuff about the conditions of the ocean. So let me explain that a bit more. That's a hawksbill sea turtle right there. Uh, this turtle. Uh, uh, died many years ago and was in a freezer in Hawaii when I got there. And then we did a necropsy on it. It had been in a freezer since 1992. And I said, well, let's learn something about this animal that met a bad end. And maybe we can get some information about how to manage the population better. So this animal, obviously a beautiful shell, was not hunted historically for its, its uh, meat. It was used for its shell. And you can see why. It's gorgeous. And, but the thing is, within that, within that shell, my idea is that there's probably a lot of data. 
So to first, we need, a, we need some sort of baseline record of time. And so this is one way we go about doing this. This is obviously a nuclear test in uh, probably several kilometers away from where that animal actually died that I just showed you. And this is in the Marshall Islands. Um, you can see um, that this is injecting all sorts of heavy carbon into the atmosphere, radiocarbon or 14 carbon. And what we can do is we can get a map of the memory of that radioactive carbon in the system through corals. And we did this in Hawaii. And you can just see the levels of radiocarbon are pretty much low background baseline until about 1950. And then they start to uptick. They peak in the late 60s, early 70s, depending on where you are on the planet. And then they start to gradually decline with the nuclear test ban treaty, right? But this right here is a, is a very helpful uh, calendar of radiocarbon that we can use to understand the timing of, these, of different animals in the ocean. Some of the most basic things about wildlife, like a bluefin tuna or a blue whale or even a sea turtle, is how old is it? How long is it going to live? Where did it come from? Where was it born? Where is it going to breed? These basic questions are really elusive. This is a cross-section of one of those shells that I showed you earlier. We know this animal died in 1976, but we can micro-sample along the various gradients, kind of like the grains on a log of wood, right? But one line isn't necessarily one year. And so what we do is we use tools much like what your dentist will use to fix a cavity, a very small, precise drill. And we drill out powder from there, and we analyze the isotopes. And using the radiocarbon isotopes, or bomb radiocarbon, we can actually go back and date each one of those sections and say, oh, this animal was born in 1953. It died in 1976. It was 23 years old. Um, now we can say, oh, this isn't just a sea turtle shell. It's a clock. But it's also a passport. It's also uh, recording toxins. And it's also recording temperature. There are literally dozens of things we can get out of that shell to understand the experience of that individual turtle that we can build a record of its environment. So let me give you uh, another example. But before I do that, I want to explain to you marine food webs in a very sort of cartoony, basic kind of way. Um, at the very basic level, we have the sun, which is its trophic position or trophic level is 0. Something that eats only the sun is trophic position of 1, like phytoplankton. Something that only eats phytoplankton is going to be two. Something that only eats that, like a small, like a sardine or something, is going to be three. A tuna that eats that is going to be four. And then something that eats that is going to be five. So there are these chains that you, when you go up the food web. Now, one of the things that people have looked over time is to measure the aggregate performance of a fishery by getting its mean trophic level. So you look at all the fish that were caught. You assign a trophic level to each one. You weight it by the mass. And then you just scale up. Now, if you look at over time, in different parts of the ocean, this is the Northwest Atlantic, the Northeast Atlantic, the Southeast Pacific, and then the Mediterranean, you can see as catch and fish goes up, the trophic position goes down. That means those food webs or those chains are getting smaller. That's something we want to avoid, because that means the systems are getting simpler, less complex, less resilient, and they're losing some of the top predators. Now, this has been a subject of a lot of debate, gone back and forth. Because when you use fisheries data to measure the performance of a fishery, there are inherent biases. Um, what you can see in this plot in the lower left is the importance of anchovy. When the anchovy catch goes up, the, the trophic position of the aggregate fishery goes way down because it's a low foraging fish, right? And so there's been a lot of debate about this. Well, one of the things we said is trophic level, kind of an interesting idea. But maybe if we don't use fisheries data to measure it, maybe if we use, because that has inherent economic biases, what if people decided they don't want to use anchovy anymore? They want to use natural fertilizer instead of fish fertilizer. What if there is a moratorium in the US on a certain kind of fishery? That'll change the catch. So the ecosystem isn't changing. It's just the economic rules are changing, right? So we actually want to measure what we're interested in measuring without artifacts. It's a huge issue. In, in observation and measurement, right? So we said, why don't we look at these birds? Because they're also interested in eating fish. Um, and they're like us. They're searching the ocean for top predatorial fish. Um, but they're not subject to economic constraints like we are. And one of the things about those cool drones that Ambari and other people make is they're fascinating, but they can't go back in time. 
They're not time machines. But working with museums and repositories, we can actually go back in time. And that study I just showed you, those kind of weighing things, they're based on fishery statistics, which are largely after World War II. So you're limited to data back to 1950. Of course, the ocean was changing before 1950. Of course, we were fishing before 1950. Of course, climate change was happening before 1950. So let's go back before 1950. But in order to do that, we have to be creative. And so we started going to museums and getting seabirds. These birds are from the late 1800s. And we can measure throughout time their trophic position by looking at the ratio of amino acids in their feathers. So these birds have thousands of feathers. These are precious specimens. We don't want to harm them. But we can just go in and take two feathers. You ne the bird never knows we, we came and left, right? And even an expert would not even know that we took those feathers. We take body feathers. We don't take the beautiful, long, primary flight feathers, the, like the kinds you're used to like dipping in an ink bottle and writing with. No, these are like the downy feathers in the breast. We take two of these. There's another 9,000 there, 9, there waiting left. And, um, but importantly, these resources are already there. Natural history repositories, museums, collections, there are, these are all over the world. And they're literally just data archives sitting in a drawer, right? And so we're trying to tap some of the potential of these to understand long-term trends in the ocean. We went and used this technique called compound-specific stable isotope analysis in amino acids. Kind of rolls off the tongue. But what we can do is, similar to the heavy carbon theory, uh, this is not a radioisotope, this is a stable isotope, but we can look at where they are in the food level based on the nitrogen that they're accruing, the heavy nitrogen. And what we found in looking at eight different species is that you can see in the lower left that pink plot is an ensemble of all those species of birds. Their trophic position is declining. And it's almost exactly the same magnitude of decline as was measured in the fisheries data. But what's really cool about this is because they're birds and people are fascinated by birds and have studied for birds for a long time, is we actually know the diet of these birds. Because those, that dot on there with the huge error bars is one point in time where some of my colleagues in Hawaii actually captured a lot of these birds and looked at their stomach contents and basically got the stomach contents of hundreds of seabirds, which you can imagine what that experience was like. Um, it, was, it was a little pungent, I would say. Um, but nonetheless, they reconstructed the diets of all these animals, and we can then, we have two sources of data now. We have diet contents, which are pretty primary source, and then we reconstructed it from the amino acids in their feathers beginning in 1890 and then sequentially over time to today. Now what we can do is we have the trophic levels and we have the diets. We can actually solve for X, and we can actually look at their diets over time. We can reconstruct what the diets would have been to produce those trophic levels. And what we can see, if you look in the lower left, the ensemble for the all species, is that squid populations in the North Pacific have doubled in the last 130 years. So that's just describing what's happening right through the feathers. This is a, an albatross, a lacean albatross. Of course, it's an, uh, very well known for its ability to fly very efficiently over long areas and search law, uh, huge areas of the ocean with very little energy expended. You may not know this, but its wing is the archetype for the Mars plane that's being designed right now by NASA. Um, this plane has no propulsion. It's just a glider. They're going to drop it in the outer atmosphere of Mars, and it's just going to descend, hopefully at a very slow rate. They're hoping for three minutes, because the atmosphere has never been measured in Mars. They have a rover, but they don't have a plane. But the design of this wing is called a Prandtl wing, and it's designed basically off the same principles as an albatross wing. So it's a pretty good flyer, that's all I'm going to say. Um, but now that we have, we can say the trophic positions have changed over time. The fish that they're eating has changed over time. Why is that happening? Well, here comes machine learning again. We take various measurements of ecomorphology. We take various measurements of the climate data in the North Pacific, and we take various ways, uh, data streams of fisheries. And we can say all these things could be affecting why these birds and their trophic position is declining. It could be the birds themselves. Some of them are really great flyers like albatross. Some of them are a little chunkier and have shorter wings and can't fly as far. Um, then we have all these things going on with climate. We have all these things going on with fisheries. So what's causing it? And so we can run through and apply machine learning, random forest algorithms, and build models to understand this that the human eye or some more standard statistical methods like general linearized models can't do. And we can say that from all of this, I will tell you that all of those things matter. 
Um, because these animals don't get driven by one variable, they get driven by many variables because the ocean is a multidisciplinary space. So if you're an albatross, you can fly further, but climate change is also happening and commercial fisheries are also taking your preferred fish out of the ocean. And so we can do all of those things, but the important point that I'm trying to say here is that we started with feathers. We started with birds in a drawer that weren't being used for anything. And we were able to build this whole story about how the ocean is changing and how squid populations are growing just from looking at amino acids in bird feathers. So let me give you another example back to home. Again, the Monterey Bay. I mentioned that we have our roots in the uh, Stanford uh, Marine Lab, which is right next door, Hopkins Marine Lab. They've been there at that location for 100 years, and they have been every morning since the early 1900s have been the, the docent in charge, uh, go out at 8 a.m., dip a bucket of water into the ocean, put a thermometer in it, and measure the temperature. Now they did that every day of the week except Sunday for about 10 years, and then they were like, well, to hell with it, we'll do it Sunday too. And uh, so we have this really cool data record, but we had, this is going back to instruments versus proxies, right? About 1919, we have those data records on the temperature of the ocean every morning at 8 a.m. So from those data, we can learn a few things. We can look at the average temperature, but often what's really important is the extremes. So if I just look at that time series of thermometer in a bucket at 8 a.m. from our colleagues next door, we can see that the hottest week of the year has changed and has become two degrees C hotter today than it was when they first started in 1919. Okay, so think about that. You may say, well, two C isn't terrible. Um, maybe it's not great, um, but then if you look at another way of measuring it, if we look at when that hot week is, not just how hot is that week, the extreme, the, you know, the 50, the first hottest week of the year, but not just how hot is it, but when does it occur, and it occurs about 10 days earlier. So that's not only happening, it's a higher magnitude of heat, but it's actually occurring earlier in the year. Not a huge surprise, either of those things, but then if you actually say, let's not look at weeks, Let's look at days, and let's look at extreme heat days. This is where it really gets interesting, and we see there are now 68 more extreme heat days than there were 100 years ago. This is just one century in one place, and this is the value of data. We wouldn't be able to have, wouldn't be able to search these records and come up with these statistics or have these metrics if we didn't have the memory, right? But we can actually go back further than when they were measuring with a thermometer, with um, with a human actually going out there with a sensor. And that's actually with macroalgae. People have been collecting algae probably as long as people have been going into the ocean. It's really easy to do. Um, it basically, uh, the procedure goes like this. You reach down, you pick up the algae, and you put it in your pocket. You know? <laughs> It's a little bit more complex. Usually you press it between two pieces of paper. But we have an herbarium at the aquarium called the herbarium, aquarium herbarium. And we've been collecting since the late 70s when we started scoping out what we were going to, um, when the aquarium started getting designed and built. But our neighbors next door have been collecting algae since the 1890s and even before a little bit. So th this is the same uh, genus of red algae, Calophyllus. And you can see that even though it's been kept between two pieces of paper for 100 and uh, almost 30 years, it looks red, it still looks the same, and it's in remarkably good condition. So what we can do is we can actually recreate the temperature of the ocean in which that alga specimen lived by looking at the oxygen isotopes. We can look at the nutrients in that ocean. We can look at the pollution in that ocean. We can look at, this is, a, this is an organism that roots in the bottom so it didn't migrate, so we can't say, oh, what's its passport? Did it go to Japan and come back? It did not do that. We can say that right now with no analyses. But this is really important. And so what we're now doing is trying to say, well, these are all our specimens over time. We didn't collect it at equal amounts. But we can go back and use these algae, or we can use birds, or we can use tuna, we can use otters, we can use sharks to really learn a ton about the ocean. We just need to sort of go into the memory, find the platform, find the drone, whatever animal or plant that is, get the sensor out of it, and then recreate that. Thank you very much.
could prioritize um, sort of interventions. Uh, mm. Do you have anything you would call out? What sort of interventions are you to referring? like to improve? Like, if we're going on this downward trend um, in a lot of ways, do you have suggestions of focus areas, you know, for all of us as consumers, or you know? I think one of the uh, before we get there, I think the um, it's an important question, and it's and it's the obvious question. I think uh, how do you prioritize what problems to address, and then because you can't do everything, it's let's just say it's difficult to do everything. Um, I would say that one of the issues that's been really fascinating as a scientist and a conservationist to observe is the public engagement on the issue of microplastic. We were not really concerned in talking about that 10 years ago. That is not a new issue. It's been identified for a while. It just really seems to have captured the environmental consciousness and even the public consciousness is what we, the garbage patch. And I think the way that we think about that is now that we know Let's do something about it, right? That's why Sylvia Earle and others would say something like that. I think that's a it's a really good way. Now that we have the information, now that we have the data, what are we gonna what are we gonna do about it? I think when it comes to plastic, the easiest thing to do is to not use single-use plastic, a throwaway or recyclable water bottle that basically has a one-use lifetime and then it gets repurposed to something else. Um, and so what I would say is uh, that's the easiest thing to address. But it's pervasive. You see single-use plastic in a lot of different places. Um, and I think that would be something that you can immediately do. I think the choices that we make when it comes to climate change, which probably um, the, the, one of the things that I've heard, and these are very difficult things to measure, but if we were to stop looking at the issue of climate change versus the issue of plastic, what's more important? Um, if we were to stop, if we had a magic button that we could turn off all carbon emissions, we could go carbon neutral today. We would still be dealing with the problem of climate change 1,000 years from now. Because the Earth's climate system is so complex and the ocean is a huge reservoir of heat that it takes a long time for things to equilibrate. One of the reasons that perhaps climate change isn't as severe today as it, we might think it would be is because the ocean is holding so much of the heat. And so it's like this buffer that's controlling um, our climate system. So 1,000 years for climate. If we were to do the same kind of thing and magically turn off our plastic and microplastic pollution switch, we would probably be dealing with this for another 40 years. Very different magnitude of the problem. So climate is probably something that is going to affect everyone and has been for decades. And I would say the, cho the choices that we make in terms of our carbon emissions and our carbon consumption are massive. The food that you eat, the travel that you do, the people tuning in from other places that didn't fly here, that actually are just tuning in online, great choice. Um, and I think we just need to prioritize those decisions. We're even looking at this in our research programs. We have three different research uh, projects that we could do. And we're evaluating right now, well, how does sustainability factor into this? These are all three very, um, this is the, it's a, we have a great, we have a great problem. We have three fascinating research programs. One, um, one project on X, one project on Y, one project on Z, but they're not all the same in terms of their carbon consumption. Some of them would be maybe require more energy, and that's into our consciousness right now about how we prioritize and choose projects for just for research. Is there any policy component you would add to the plastic space, um, you know, in terms of an intervention you wish you could play a magic wand? So I'm a scientist, and we have a lot of policy experts that we work with. But I would say that uh, policies addressing single-use plastic, plastic is so pervasive in our society, I'm probably, I'm holding plastic in my hand right now, um, but I'm not going to recycle it or throw it away. I'm going to use it for a very long time. And I would say that uh, policies relating to single-use plastic are just things that we need to incentivize that going away. First of all, thank you so much for coming. That talk was amazing. I think we all agree. Uh, one question I was wondering about is, um, so you talked about this memory lab that your guys are building. Is, but you also talked about the creative ways that you use to gather all the data that is 
you know, hidden everywhere and very difficult to find. So I was just wondering, is the um, goal to open up the lab to everyone? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I have feathers in my room from 10 years ago. Like, are you going to encourage people to participate and um, put the data that they might have um, at the disposal of the aquarium? And also, uh, are you going to make the data uh, available to other scientists and great, great. Uh, other people? That's a great question. So the first thing is I want to say is I've had written above my desk for a long time, more data is more better, right? Even though the grammar isn't great, the people get what I mean by that. Um, so uh, when I was doing the menus project in Hawaii, there's this thing in Hawaii, you may not have heard of it, called coconut wireless. It, it's the word getting out, you know? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a joke, of course. Um, it's the gossip train. And uh, when I was working on this project, coconut wireless was in full effect. And I would get people, um, and then when we published the, the study, um, and it was on NPR, I got a lot of random solicitations. People just sent me stuff in the mail. But I would get calls and saying, hey, I have uh, five menus from 1960. Do you want them? And I'm like, yes, of course I do. So um, when it comes to wildlife, it's a little trickier because you tend to need permits. So we wouldn't say, hey, here's, a, here's an open data call for seabird feathers because we want the, the pros to do that um, in permitted fashion. But I would say that, um, Yes, there will be, we are going to be increasingly communicating uh, with the general public about ways they can get involved and contribute data uh, to, our, to our projects. And as we do that, I think that's an incredible point because crowdsourcing and involving citizen science is a, is a very big component of where we're going. On the second question about open, open access, open source, um, we're a nonprofit and it's, it's one of our core values to be open access and open source. And Bari, um, they make some amazing devices, and then they put the blueprints online. It's really amazing that they do that um, because they're the same, they're, they have the same DNA as we do. Uh, we want to be open access. So we use Open Science Framework. We use GitHub. We, we use Figshare, ResearchGate. We put all of our publications online. We're increasingly trying to work with only open access journals because we want to work with people all over the world who may not have access to a university library in which those things are free and openly available. So we, it's a huge value of ours to make our data accessible, um, to invite people into our research projects in a way that they can meaningfully contribute. I mean, be a co-author in our work. Um, we want to solve problems. And we know we need more data and more experts. We firmly believe in the theory of plenty, that the more eyes and the more minds you have on a project, the more comes out of it. It's not like we have to golem it. Um, so we can get all the glory. That's not our position at all. We want to um, open science, open access is, is where we are. So yes. And we're, we're building the, the data infrastructure to make that seamlessly happen. And then the user interface, that's very intuitive. I think some of the problems that we're actually, I'll go even a step further. Some of the problems that we're dealing with, everyone in this room may be in the choir and may be like super on board. But there, let's be honest, there are some more difficult issues that aren't so obvious and have to get people with disparate beliefs and political persuasions to agree on. So one of the things that we're doing, when we publish a paper, we're now publishing uh, transparent GUIs, uh, graphical user interfaces, to let people say, well, we did the study this way, but if you pull the dials in different ways, you can get a different answer. So some of the problems we're solving, we're trying to actually recruit, do it a different way. And I think that's where science is going to be going with much more interactive, where the, the analytical framework is on the back end, and you just have a user interface, and you're using machine learning. You're just pushing little dials with your mouse. And that's where we're going to be going through things like um, uh, the frameworks, usually on the R platform, where we can do this. Yeah. What you were just referring to with how you're um, building your research now so that it can be more presentable to people with other views. Is that how you're um, making it more open to things like um, getting fisheries on board for things like CITES with bluefin, things like that? Because I know in the past it's been a challenge to get the fisheries and other people, lobbyists, stuff like that on board with getting protected fisheries, all of that, all of that fun stuff integrated. Um, just the challenge of having species protected and sure. scientists working together with all of that. You can put it more eloquently. I'll let you do that. So that's the main question. Is there a way to get science working together with people who wish to deny 
um, science or use it in a way um, that supports fisheries versus science? Sure. I mean, it's, it's a great question. I would say that um, what I would say is that a lot of people care about bluefin tuna for different reasons. And um, I think everyone pretty much cares about bluefin tuna, it's just for different incentives. And their incentives are prioritized differently. If you're a bluefin tuna fisherman, you can't fish for bluefin if there are no bluefin. So um, it's, it's in everyone's interest for there to be bluefin tuna. It's just how much are extracted every year. But uh, the, I think that what you're getting at is exactly the point, is that when we do analyses and we come to a conclusion, we not only want to be transparent about the data, about how we got there, but then we say, and here, here's an interactive where you can choose your own incentives. Think about a situation like um, um, choosing where to put a marine protected area, a preserve in the ocean. Um, if your incentives are to protect climate change or to rebuild fisheries or to have a variety of other things, those places could show up differently in the ocean to protect biodiversity. Um, and what we can do is we can say, here are the 10 most uh, the, the top 10 market share of ideas for ocean conservation for marine protected areas. We could build those data layers, there exists now, and we could say, and you can weight them however you want. This one 10, this one zero, this one five, and then it gives you a map. That's what we're working on right now, those kinds of interactives. With the success at places like Cabo Como, is hmm. it easier to prove that it's capable to bring back species and biodiversity? So there, are, you mentioned Cabo Pomo. There's some great success stories of conservation working. I would just look at the great whales in the Pacific Ocean. Blue whale, humpback whale, gray whale. These are basically candidates for removing from the endangered species list now um, because their populations have been growing at 3 to 6% a year um, ever since they put a moratorium on whaling. And so uh, what's amazing is if you don't kill whales, they actually do well. <laughs> and I think that's something everyone agrees on. Um, and so there's a lot of examples like that. And so it's just how do you get protection? How do you, get the, how do you serve the dual mandate of commercial fisheries and conservation? That's the question. And how much do weigh in which one? And I think when you move towards a, a data-rich, open, relatable interactive framework a lot of the a lot of the disagreements can be about be, can be about we don't trust your data we don't trust your methods and and you're doing it behind closed doors and you're not inviting us to be a part of it well all of those disagreements go away when you make the data available when you make the processes transparent and rational and when you make their interactives online that really anyone can, can very intuitively understand. And that's what I think is we're trying to meet everyone where they're because all of those complaints are totally valid. We don't want secret data. We don't want secret methods. We don't want secret rooms with secret decisions. We want it all to be out there. The whole point of science is that it's, it's egalitarian and democratic and accessible. Um, and so we need to have the infrastructures and the platforms to make it that way. So when you were talking about the Keeling curve measuring the mm. CO2 levels and uh, at, at 1958 and onwards, I think uh, we have an instrument that I guess is very, very good at this. And before it, it's more of a proxy. How do you align the data from the two and, and possibly even maybe many disparate historical sources? How do you make sure that they are calibrated or that sort of thing for, for something like this with the Ocean Memory Lab? Mm. I think it's like a symphony. You have a bunch of different instruments and you're trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. And uh, when it comes to, I'm less of an expert on the CO2 series. It, that is a, there's a lot of research groups from a lot of countries and a lot of NSF funding and a lot of major programs that went into building that curve. It may, you may look at that curve and say, oh, it's just a simple graph. But it's so much work went into that graph. Sometimes when you look at figures and we can just scrape data, put a cool viz together in like an hour. And then you look at something like that and that is like, PhDs and careers and awards and a huge amount of effort went into that. But getting, getting together uh, a proxy and a, a calibrated data set is usually the beginning of a lot of the thought of some of our projects. Is we, we start with some sort of training set 
and then we start with something that we think is a good proxy, and how do we wed those two together so that we can take the training set away and then we can do it at scale. This is what we're doing with microplastic. When we look at the Raman laser spectroscopy, we train the spectra on known types, and then we go out and we do the proxies. The problem is, is that plastic in the ocean has been tumbled around in the waves or at depth, extreme temperatures, different acidities in an animal's stomach for a while. So it's not pristine. So we, but that's actually part of the magic because we can actually now, using spectroscopy, we're working to age some of these particles. We can say, not only is it nylon, but it's nylon that's been in the ocean for 40 years. Now that's really helpful information. As opposed to saying, well, 40% of it's nylon, 40% of it's polycarbonate, 40% of it's polyatomide, or that's more than 100%. But, um, but you, you get the idea. But I think just having those training sets, when you go back in time, the error bars can get a little broader. And so it's just, the question is just realizing the limits of your data and using a training set that is unassailable. I say that's just our general approach going about it. Some proxies are are more difficult than others, and sometimes it's a proxy of a proxy. It's like a Matryoshka doll of data, and then you get that little thing on the inside, right? And we want to have, we want to kind of limit our proxies, um, but it's amazing what you can do if you have some data to begin with, as opposed to nothing. Thank you very much.